Chapter thirty five of Carpenter's Geographical Reader Asia by Frank Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. The Villages of India Home Life. Today we shall see something of the East Indians outside the cities. Most of the people live in villages from which the farmers go out daily to their work in the fields. Each village has also its tradesmen and mechanics including a carpenter shoemaker barber and blacksmith it has its priest and school teacher and is governed by a head man aided by a clerk and the village council the lands outside the village belong either to the people themselves or to landlords who may live in other parts of the country and to whom the farmers pay a money rent or a part of the crop but let us suppose ourselves travelling across the great plain of north india we are riding on the railroad through the valley of the ganges over some of the richest soil of the world the sun shines brightly the crops grow luxuriantly and birds by the thousands sing in the trees all nature is joyful and mother earth seems abounding in riches the only poor thing we can see is man there are few lands upon earth where the people struggle so hard and get so little as in india there are some parts of this valley which support two persons to the acre and where three hundred and twenty get their living out of one hundred and sixty acres which is the size of many an american farm in some places the population is so great that it averages more than twelve hundred to the square mile so great that the land does not produce enough for the people in many parts of hindustan the peasants eat only just about enough to keep them alive and millions support their families on less than a dollar a week we see women who are working in the fields for less than five cents a day in other regions the people are fewer some sections of the peninsula are less thickly settled than our eastern states and in some the land is a desert where there are no people at all or only nomadic tribes who drive their cattle and sheep from place to place to find pasture let us now take a look at the farmers as they work in the fields we find them everywhere toiling the men are ploughing and digging and the women and children are hoeing and weeding the crops all wear scanty clothing and their black skins shine like oiled ebony under this hot indian sun the men are clad in little more than a strip of white cotton which they wrap around their bodies pulling the end through their legs and fastening it at the waist they have turbans of white on their heads a few of the richer men may have a jacket of cotton and perhaps an additional strip of cloth to wind about their shoulders but as a rule both men and women look as though they had dragged the sheets from their beds and wrapped them about their persons as clothing some of the women have on a sleeveless jacket which ends under the armpits and below this a skirt which falls from the waist to the feet exposing a wide belt of bare skin others do not wear the skirt but use a full waistcloth instead almost all of the people are barefooted and some are bare-legged as well while very small children wear no clothing at all nevertheless the mornings and evenings are cold and they shiver as the winds blow through the valleys now look at that village of mud huts over there the houses are not as good as the stables we use for our cattle the average hut which is about fifteen feet square is made of sun-dried brick with a roof of thin tiles or of thatch its floor is the ground plastered with cow dung and its windows are mere holes in the walls the fireplace is a few bricks laid one upon the other there is no chimney and the smoke finds its way out through the door or from under the eaves well-to-do farmers may have several such huts with a mud wall about them but what are those lumps of brown mud about the size and shape of a fat buckwheat cake which we see plastered on the walls of the houses they cover the outsides of the huts and piles of them have been stacked up for sale those mud cakes are the fuel of a great part of east india they are made of cow manure and earth mixed together and moulded to shape by the hands of the women and girls wood is scarce in many parts of hindustan and the children walk along the roads or through the fields following the cattle and gathering up every bit to make into fuel the cooking is all done with such cakes but let us enter a hut how uncomfortable it is there is nothing homelike about it 
the hut has but one room and it is dark and smoky there are neither tables nor chairs there is no place to rest except on the earth floor and the family squat there at their meals we ask what they eat and find that the chief diet consists of beans millet and similar grains ground up and made into cakes or cooked as a mush they use peppers and other hot things with their food they seldom have meat and indeed many of them would as soon think of becoming cannibals as of eating a tenderloin steak they regard the cow as holy and they would be cast out by their families if they ate beef some of the classes or castes are meat eaters and all use a rancid melted butter called ghee the meals are usually served in large brass bowls with smaller ones for the curry and condiments the dishes are clean and they shine like well-polished gold there are no forks and all eat with their fingers the men are served first and the women take what is left in many places the food is cooked out of doors most people have only two meals a day and some only one outside the huts we see the women making the flour for the family they pour the wheat or millet through a hole in a round stone which rests on top of another and then turn the top stone around its weight grinding the flour the flour is then mixed with water and baked into cakes over the coals but where are the beds and sleeping places of the family there is nothing which looks like a couch inside the hut and no straw on the floor we can easily see by going to the door the beds stand outside the house during the daytime they are taken there at sunrise in order that the people may have more room the hindu bed is merely a netting of ropes stretched over a framework of wood with wooden legs at the corners it is not more than four feet in length so that the sleeper usually lies with his legs doubled up if he stretched them out they would hang over the foot of the bed sometimes a part of the family sleeps out of doors the poorer classes do not use nightgowns they wrap themselves up in the sheets they wear in the daytime and seem able to sleep anywhere even though it be on the bare ground or the stone floor of a railway station but what are those curtains hung over the doors of many of the huts they are put there to keep the men who pass by from seeing the women within the women of the upper classes live in the back rooms of the houses for women are usually secluded in india and are never seen by any other men than those of their own families during our stay in the village we see a wedding procession the groom is a hindu boy of fifteen and the bride a little hindu girl only eight years of age the groom has a red cloth cap on his head and is dressed in tawdry red clothing he is riding a white pony and with him is a crowd of bare-legged men and boys his relatives and friends who are trotting along on foot as an escort the little bride follows behind but we cannot see her for she is shut up in that large box covered with red cloth the box is hung to a pole and is carried on the shoulders of men behind come some women who are bringing the housekeeping furniture supplied by the bride one group carries her bed and another holds up a tray upon which are her cooking utensils consisting of three or four iron pots and a rice jar the whole outfit would not be worth more than a dollar fifty of our money we are surprised at this marriage of children and learn that the bride and groom will not live together until the girl is about twelve years of age then she will come from her parents home to that of her husband and be married for good every year thousands of indian girls are engaged to be married while they are still babies they are then looked upon as wives although they do not live with their husbands until they have reached the age of ten or twelve years if in the meantime the husband should die they become widows and as such their fate is a sad one hindu widows cannot marry again and they are despised by their families and every one else a widow usually lives in the house of her mother-in-law who does all that she can to make her life miserable for it is supposed that the husband is happy in heaven just in proportion as his widow is unhappy on earth she cannot go to parties she must eat by herself and must cook her own food apart from the family the women of india are in many respects the slaves of their husbands they receive but little education although of recent years the british have established girls schools 
and more liberty is being granted to women as time goes on the poorer women do the hardest of work we see them digging in the fields breaking stone on the roads and carrying burdens upon their heads there are some people of india however who treat their women much better the jains are now educating their daughters and the parsees of whom we have already learned something have good schools for girls the parsee women go about as they please they are beautiful and are quite as intelligent as the sisters of europe or the united states End of chapter 35chapter thirty six of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b among the indian farmers the east indians are a nation of farmers two-thirds of them live by tilling the soil and the country all told has more farmers than there are people in north and south america as we have already learned the peninsula of hindustan has almost every variety of soil and climate and it therefore produces all sorts of crops in the high dry lands of the northwest great quantities of excellent wheat are raised while the valley of the ganges and other lowlands yield the finest of rice rice is one of the chief crops wherever the rainfall is heavy and in the hot soils near madras where the lands can be irrigated three crops are often raised in one year in some parts of india the wheat is grown on irrigated lands and in others the crop depends on the rains brought by the moisture-laden winds from the indian ocean but let us go out into the country and see how the farming is done the fields are usually small and the methods are rude see that man ploughing he is a well-to-do farmer for he has on a turban and more clothes than the ordinary man he is driving two bullocks yoked to what seems little more than a stick shod with iron that is the hindu plough it is so light that the man can carry it out to the field on his shoulders and so formed that it only scratches the soil nevertheless the fields are gone over again and again and the land is fairly well tilled producing large crops as we go on we see but little machinery the grain is cut with a sickle and the wheat is sometimes pulled up by the roots wheat is threshed by being trodden out by bullocks and buffaloes and is then winnowed in the wind the straw is saved for feeding the cattle but there are no barns to be seen and no elevators such as we have in our wheat lands the grain is piled up on the ground until it can be shipped to the market this is very wasteful and better methods are being introduced into many parts of the country among the crops raised in large quantities are cotton jute millet sugar and beans coffee is grown in madras and tea in the himalaya mountains the sugar made is from cane which thrives upon the great plain and in burma millet and beans are to be found almost everywhere and they form a large part of the food of the people cotton is india's chief fibre crop the cotton plant grows wild in some parts of hindustan and many believe that it originally came from here although the united states produces a far better cotton than any indian cotton ever grown the fiber of the indian cotton is short and for this reason it is sometimes used to mix with wool for which purpose it brings a higher price in our markets than some better cottons the east indians manufacture it into a coarse cloth which is used throughout india and which on account of its low price competes with our cotton in africa and asia the crop is grown about bombay and in madras and on the great northern plain it is planted in june and is ripe in the middle of the winter the picking season beginning in january and lasting through march one of the most interesting crops of hindustan depends for its sale largely upon the american market we use some of it every week in washing our clothes and it forms a part of many of our paints dyes and other coloring materials this is indigo hundreds of thousands of acres are devoted to it and we can learn all about how it is raised indigo comes from a reed which grows to a height of from three to five feet when the plants are ready to flower they are cut off close to the ground tied up in small bundles 
and thrown into large vats of water after about ten hours they begin to ferment the water turns yellow and it is then run off into other vats in which half-naked men stand and whip the fluid with long bamboo sticks keeping it constantly in motion for two or three hours during this process the color changes from yellow to green and the particles of blue indigo rise in flakes the liquor is then allowed to settle when the flakes sink to the bottom forming a sediment which is indigo the water is now drawn off and the indigo is boiled and pressed into cakes to be shipped to the markets there is another plant raised in india in which we are especially interested for it gives us linseed oil which when mixed with paint aids in protecting our houses from the weather it also forms a part of the oil cloth on the floors of our kitchens and bathrooms and is used for making waterproof coverings for carriages automobiles and other such things this is the flax plant the same as that from the fibres of which when grown in temperate climates linen is made the flax of india however is not good for cloth it is raised for the seeds which are full of this oil and which when pressed yield the linseed oil of commerce the plants are grown from the seeds which are drilled in rows about one foot apart they soon sprout and grow to a height of about two feet while still green they blossom out into beautiful flowers of pale blue by and by the flowers fall and the little round fruit or seed pods appear every pod has ten divisions each containing one seed the seeds are smooth shining and of a flat oval shape they have a rich chestnut color and look just like our flax seeds at home they are threshed out with flails and winnowed by throwing them up into the air while the wind blows a good crop should yield about five hundred pounds of seeds to the acre and hundreds of millions of pounds are raised every year is it not strange that these people of east india away off on the other side of the globe should be aiding us in making the paint for our houses this is only one of many things which show us how all the nations of the world are always engaged in trading with and helping one another we have seen the chinese and japanese children picking the tea leaves we use on our tables and in malaysia have watched the little brown people gathering the pepper that flavors our food everywhere we go we find the natives using something or other which has come from our country here they are lighting their homes with american petroleum there they are clad in american cotton and in many places they employ american machinery we thus learn that we are tied to almost every people on earth by what we do for them and what they are doing for us we shall find this the case with many other things in india take for instance the jute plant which thrives in a low sandy soil along the banks of the indian rivers it has a coarse fiber which is so long and strong that it makes excellent bagging this plant is grown for the most part to supply the demands of our cotton plantations it is used to wrap around the bales of raw cotton and also as a strong and firm cloth for all sorts of rough use in raising jute the seed is sown broadcast in april and by august the plants have grown to a height of a man's head as he sits upon horseback and are ready for cutting they are cut off close to the ground and are tied up into bundles which are thrown into water that the outer skin or bark may be rotted off after a time this skin can be pulled away when the fibres within which are long straight and silky are separated and washed they are then dried and put up into bales of four hundred pounds each ready to be sent to the mills or the markets the exports as jute and jute cloth amount to many millions of dollars a year we have beautiful poppies in america but they are grown in our flower gardens india has vast fields of poppies cultivated not for show but for the making of opium we see many such fields as we travel over the country they are planted under the direction of the british government which receives millions of dollars every year from the sale of this drug the laws provide that no farmer can raise poppies without the permission of the government officials and that every one who does so must agree to sell the whole of his crop to the government 
the poppy seeds are sown in november and the plants are ploughed and weeded from that time until february when they burst out into beautiful flowers as the blossoms are just ready to fall the capsules to which they are fastened are cut or scratched with a thin piece of iron this is done in the evening and by the next morning a thick juice has oozed out on each capsule this juice is opium it is of a milky white color at first but it gradually changes to a rose red it is scraped from the plant and saved it takes a great many plants to make much opium the farmer rubs the scrapings of each capsule into the palm of his left hand until he has collected several ounces when he puts them into an earthen jar after he has gathered his whole crop he turns the jars over to the government and receives the regular price for them the officials take the jars and from their contents manufacture the opium of commerce some of the crop is consumed in india and during the past a great deal has gone to china much is shipped to europe and some to the united states opium is of great value as a medicine but those who eat or smoke it soon find that they cannot get along without it they become opium drunkards and it destroys their bodies and minds in travelling over india we see large areas of irrigated lands this is especially true of the wide northern plain which has been made by the earth washings brought down from the himalayas by the great rivers these rivers are still carrying loads of rich silt which adds to the crops wherever it can be spread over the fields in this way the irrigating canals bring both food and drink to the plants moreover there are many places in hindustan where the rainfall is scanty some of the lands of such regions have likewise been irrigated and it is calculated that more than one hundred million acres of them have thus been turned into farms indeed india has so many irrigating canals that if they were joined end to end they would form a ditch long enough to reach twice around the world a great deal of the irrigation is by means of wells the water being raised from one level to another on wheels turned by bullocks or in large bags of cow skin which are dipped into the wells and then emptied into troughs from which the water flows into canals the people of india have long been farming by means of irrigation but the greater part of the canals now in use were constructed by the british government which is doing all it can to raise enough food for the people the population is so enormous that a bad season or drought is like to cause famine and in the past millions have been starved at such times this can be prevented only by the proper cultivation of the land and the government is trying to teach the people better farming it has established an agricultural department and many experiment stations where skilled men are testing new crops and seeds there are also lecturers who go about among the farmers telling them how to till their lands and what crops it will best pay to raise end of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter the stores and trades of india the business of the indian cities is carried on in bazaars much like those we saw at rangoon in burma in some of the towns there are many stores under one roof and in others they are crowded along streets so narrow that cloth is stretched above them to shut out the sun the most common store is not much bigger than a piano packing case and the dark-faced bearded merchant within sits on the floor with his wares piled about him it is so small that the customers cannot come inside it and they stand out in the street as they shop nevertheless many of these little stores are factories as well in the rear of the merchant two or more men or boys may be working away much of the goods being made where they are sold we see all sorts of manufacturing going on here for instance is the shoe bazaar shoes of bright colored leathers are hanging on the walls outside the shops and from strings tied to the ceilings inside flat on the floor sit the cobblers sewing and pegging away 
they are barefooted and they hold the leather between their toes as they sew farther on is the bazaar of the woodworkers where the carpenters are using their feet as a second pair of hands sawing and planing as they squat or kneel on the floor in another street we see scores of men drawing wire they have shops not more than six feet in width in which they are making the fine gold and silver wire for use in embroidery or in weaving brocade the wire looks like threads of fine silk the strands being so thin we cannot believe them to be metal we say as much to our guide and he thereupon asks us for a coin we hand him an american twenty-five cent piece and he tells the workmen to turn it into wire they take it and in a very short time have drawn the silver out into a strand so fine that it is almost a half mile in length there are a thousand men engaged in wire drawing in lucknow and in delhi we shall see dark-faced hindu men and boys using such gold and silver wire in embroidering ladies dresses which are to be sent to europe for sale the indians make most beautiful embroideries and they weave curtains and carpets which are unsurpassed in the world think of stuff so expensive that enough of it for a gown costs from two hundred to five thousand dollars this is the famous kincob cloth which is woven at ahmadabad in north india it is a heavy brocade of gold and silver and is perhaps the most costly stuff made anywhere but suppose we ask the merchants to show us some shawls india has long been noted for its shawls some kinds of which sell for several hundred dollars apiece the best are known as cashmere shawls being woven of the fine wool of cashmere goats they are made by hand by families who work at the trade from generation to generation it takes a long time to weave one our turbaned hindu storekeeper shows us a shawl and asks us to feel it it is as soft as down and as light as so many feathers now the man tells his clerks to open it out it is as large as a bed quilt he asks for a ring i pull one from my little finger when lo he puts one end of the shawl into the ring and draws the whole shawl through it this is the famous ring shawl of india one of the finest of all woolen fabrics the muslins of dhaka are equally fine the hanks of yarn of which the choicest are made requiring four hundred of them to weigh one pound indeed a pound of cotton was once turned into a dhaka yarn so fine that it measured two hundred and fifty miles in length the east indians make all kinds of cottons and almost every variety of fine silks and woolens much of such work is still done in the houses although of late years many mills and factories have been erected and the spinning and weaving are now done by machinery continuing our travels we observe that these people can do almost any kind of mechanical labor they make many dyes they tan and work leather and do artistic carving in ivory and wood they weave beautiful carpets and rugs and carve and mold brass which is shipped all over the world every town has its blacksmiths and coppersmiths and the whole peninsula is a beehive of industries of one kind or another at present a vast number of the things made are turned out by hand but factories are being gradually established and machinery will some day make the east indians one of the leading manufacturing peoples as we go on through the business parts of the cities we are stopped again and again by dealers and peddlers who beseech us to buy the men stand in their stores and hold up their goods crying out me poor man sahib me good man sahib buy something they now and then bring their goods out to the carriages and peddlers run along after us and throw their wares into our laps we find that nearly every important merchant has men about the hotels and on the streets who ask foreigners to come to his shop to trade each says his master's place is the cheapest but we know that if we go with him he will get a commission on the money we spend the hindus have been noted for ages for their fine work in gold and silver and in precious stones they have made not only the most beautiful rings brooches chains and other ornaments for personal adornment but have done wonders in the decoration of furniture and buildings at agra in north india 
stands the taj mahal which is thought by travellers to be the most beautiful structure of the whole world it was erected by shah jahan a mohammedan ruler of northern india as a tomb for his favourite wife it is of the purest white marble and when it was completed its interior was inlaid with jewels and precious stones another fine work of that time was the peacock throne used by the same ruler this was made in the form of a peacock the feathers being precious stones set in gold in the natural colours of the peacock's tail it was composed of diamonds rubies carbuncles emeralds and other jewels and was of such value that it cost it is said over thirty million dollars as our guide tells us these stories of india's past we observe that the women of to-day are loaded with necklaces bracelets and rings and we think it would be fine to visit the jewelry shops and perhaps buy some beautiful things to carry back home we imagine the stores must be fine and a vision of plate glass cases containing a gorgeous display of watches and rings and of pearls diamonds and other precious stones comes before us what do we find the jewelry store which we visit is little more than a hole in the wall it is only about ten feet square and its dark-skinned turbaned long-gowned merchant looks more like a beggar than an owner of gold or diamonds he salutes us politely and asks us to come in offering us a seat on the floor he then directs a servant to fetch a red cashmere shawl and spreads this out between us and him he gives another direction and the servant brings in a bundle wrapped around with a dirty white cotton cloth the bundle is set down in front of the merchant he opens it and displays upon the red shawl a stock of gold and silver jewelry which dazzles our eyes he lays out bracelets and rings of all sizes strings of pearls rubies and sapphires and also a magnificent necklace of diamonds each of which is as big as a good-sized bean to these treasures he adds strands of topazes and emeralds set in curiously carved gold hanging one by the other from a great golden band in addition there are brooches which cost a small fortune and we almost gasp as we see the wealth laid out before us we pick up a ring and talk for an hour before we can buy in india there are no fixed prices and one always bargains in making a purchase we cannot get accustomed to this method of buying and soon learn to say just how much we will give and then walk away if our offer is fair we seldom go more than a few steps before the merchant runs up with the goods and grudgingly tells us that we can have them at our own price the average hindu has more time than money and he will talk all day for a very few cents in doing business with the east indians we use silver and copper coins whose value is based on the rupee a piece of silver worth about thirty-three cents of our money or about one-third of a dollar the rupee is a little larger than an american quarter the smaller coins are silver annas and copper pice and pies it takes sixteen annas to make one rupee so that an anna is worth about two american cents three pies make one pice and twelve pies an anna a pie is equal to about one-sixth of a cent before the british came the east indians had no banking system to speak of most of their savings were either in the shape of gold and silver coins which they hid in their houses or buried underground or in jewelry consisting of ornaments of gold and silver and diamonds and other precious stones much wealth is still kept in these ways but there are now banks all over the country including postal savings banks in which about thirteen hundred thousand people have money on deposit the trade and wealth of india is steadily growing and this is so not only as regards its home trade but also as to what it buys from and sells to other countries the imports in some years amount to more than five hundred million dollars and the exports are often much greater india's foreign commerce including exports and imports is in excess of that of any other country of asia so you see that it has an important place in the markets of not only this continent but of the whole world End of chapter 37
asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the religions of india a visit to benares the people of east india are very religious as we travel about we see temples and shrines almost everywhere we meet pilgrims going from one holy place to another and frequently see men and women praying to idols of horrible shapes the empire is one of many religions it has nine million buddhists about sixty million mohammedans and more than two hundred million hindus besides these there are the parsees whom we saw at bombay and many people who worship spirits as well as some who converted by our missionaries now believe in christianity we have already learned something of buddhism in japan siam and burma and we shall find many mohammedans as we go on to the westward through persia arabia and turkey the hindus are to be found in india only and there are so many of them that they number about one-eighth of all the world's people they have a strange religion based upon a belief in one god who may appear in so many different forms that the people are sometimes said to have millions of gods these gods are often represented by images or idols hinduism has had a great effect upon india it has caused the people to be divided into classes or castes each of which must do certain things follow certain trades and be superior or subservient to the other castes at first there were only four great castes the priest the warriors the farmers and the slaves but these four castes have been so subdivided that there is now a special caste for every trade and every walk in life it is not permitted that a man should do anything outside the work of his caste if a boy's father is a priest the boy must follow the priesthood if a merchant he must be a merchant if a shoemaker a shoemaker and if a street sweeper he can have no hope but that he will be sweeping streets for the term of his life it is easy to see how backward a people must be when hampered by conditions like these it is also believed that when a man dies he will be born again as a plant an animal or a mineral or perhaps as a human being of a higher or lower class than that in which he now is moreover one may acquire merit by torturing himself and for that reason some forsake home and friends to wander among strangers to be considered saints some fast until they are all skin and bone some sleep on beds of broken stones or sharp spikes while others try to do without sleep altogether some will stand on one leg for days at a time and others will hold up an arm or a leg until it becomes stiff and cannot be moved but suppose we visit the holy city of benares where tens of thousands of hindus go every month to worship and bathe in the ganges the ganges is considered sacred throughout its whole length but the spot where benares is situated is regarded as the most holy of all the hindu who dies within ten miles of it feels sure of salvation and if he can bathe there he believes that his sins will be washed away forever benares contains about two hundred thousand people and many thousands of pilgrims from all parts of india go there every year some come on the trains and others on foot walking hundreds of miles and kneeling down to pray at every few steps on the way when they arrive they move about from temple to temple saying their prayers they go into the river to bathe and pray and they may be seen everywhere engaged in their devotions let us suppose that we are among them the day is just breaking and we are starting out to see them at their baths in the ganges the roads are already filled with dark-skinned men women and children clad in long strips of cotton colored white red and blue each wraps his strip around his body and pulls it over his face so that even the mouth and nostrils are covered and we can see only the eyes the air is cold and damp at this early hour the worshippers are of all classes some are half naked and the legs of many are bare to the thighs those of the richer classes have on woolen blankets and cashmere shawls of bright red the poor are barefooted and only the richest wear shoes the women are gorgeous with jewelry even the poorest have their arms covered from wrist to elbow with silver or brass bracelets all have anklets of silver or gold 
while not a few actually wear rings and bells on their toes some have rings in their noses and these rings are often as big around as the bottom of a tin cup so that its owner must put her food through the ring as she eats every one has a brass jar to fetch the holy water of the ganges up to the temple or to carry some back to his home we push our way through the crowds to the upper end of the city where we get a boat upon which to go down the river we have six dusky sailors clad in white gowns and high turbans to row us and we direct them to keep near the shore we float along the stream not far from the steps which lead up to the temples lining the right bank of the river there are about three miles of these steps upon which thousands of half-naked dripping men and women are continually moving their wet clothes cling to their bodies and little streams run down the steps now look at the crowd in the river hundreds are bathing standing near the shore with the water up to their waists others are kneeling on the banks or muttering prayers as they sit there lifting up their brass bowls again and again to pour the sacred fluid over their bodies but see the sun rises its rays make the half-naked people shine like polished mahogany they turn the brass jars to gold and the jewelry becomes more gorgeous than ever against the wet background of the dark skins we reach over the edge of the boat and dip our hands into the water it is cold and we do not wonder that the people shiver as they pour it over their bodies some are invalids and they look lean and sickly many are brought here to die for they feel sure that if they should pass away in the river itself their life in the next world will be happy as we look a confused noise of many voices in prayer rises from the great crowd around us and we wonder at this worship of a stream which is so real to these millions of people among the bathers we see many gray-haired a skeleton-like old man wearing nothing but a waistcloth glued as it were by the water to his now dripping skin is standing there at the foot of that temple see he throws his shriveled arms upward and with long snaky fingers outstretched through chattering teeth prays to the sun just beyond him is a young woman who is casting flowers into the ganges and all about us on the drier parts of the steps under great umbrellas half-naked black-skinned priests are sitting they have little boxes of red and white paint before them and they mark the bathers as they come from the water with the charms and emblems of the great hindu gods floating on down the stream we see a thick smoke arising from a little hollow or ravine in the bank and ask our boatman to stop there the smoke comes from some fires which have been built just a little back from the water for burning the dead the hindus believe in cremation and think that if their bodies are burned on the banks of the ganges and the ashes thrown into the river their souls will go straight to the better land such funeral pyres may be seen everywhere along the ganges and there are burning ghats or cremation places in all the cities but let us leave our boat and visit the temples there are one thousand in benares and they represent many gods they are of every description the golden temple being the finest this temple has spires plated with gold which may be seen miles away in the country about it is devoted to shiva a terrible god who is supposed to sit enthroned on one of the himalaya mountains where he is waited upon by innumerable spirits one of his symbols is the bull as shown in a temple near by where a hundred live sacred bulls are kept all the year round they are white and dove-coloured animals beautifully formed having humps on their backs and long ears which hang down like those of a rabbit as we enter the courtyard of the temple we find the people feeding and fondling the bulls they throw flowers to them and put garlands of flowers around their necks some have brought water from the ganges in their brass jars they offer this to the bulls and chant prayers as they drink outside the temple are men peddling flowers to feed to the animals and they are kept fat upon flowers grass and vegetables leaving this temple we drive on through the city seeing sacred cattle here and there working we have already observed them in all parts of india hauling carts and pulling the ploughs they are also harnessed to cabs and sulky like carriages their horns often decorated with ribbons and flowers but there is one curious worshipping place 
that we must visit before leaving benares this is a temple devoted to durga the wife of shiva it is also supposed by some to be the home of the monkey god hanuman it is called the monkey temple by travellers and we do not wonder why as we enter its court the temple is surrounded by a wall over which hang mighty trees filled with chattering monkeys and there are other monkeys playing about in the court there are peddlers at the entrance who have popcorn for sale we buy some and throw it down on the floor as it falls the monkeys cry out they leap down in droves and fight over the corn we feed them again and again while the guards warn us to be careful saying that the animals are vicious and often bite strangers End of chapter 38chapter thirty nine of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the native states of india a visit to the rajah of jaipur today we are to visit one of the chief native states parts of india as we have learned are not directly ruled by the british scattered over hindustan are many provinces some large and some small which are governed by native princes or rajahs each of whom has the help and advice of a british resident or official whom the viceroy stations at the capital the rajahs collect the taxes and administer the laws they can make public improvements organize schools and develop their countries or not as they will but if a rajah misgoverns or oppresses his subjects the british adviser rebukes him and the viceroy may even dethrone him and appoint another man in his place some of these rajahs are well educated and they are doing all they can to better the condition of their people several have established factories and schools and others are making great irrigation works and teaching their farmers how to get the most out of the land almost all of them live in great splendor having gorgeous palaces with thousands of servants some have armies with camel and elephant troops to impress their own subjects as to their power although the british do not allow them to make war upon their neighbors they often ride upon elephants when they go in state from one place to another the most powerful of these native rulers is the nizam of hyderabad whose capital city surrounded by walls we have already seen another strong rajah governs mysore in south india and others have provinces in parts of the great plain in kashmir and in the himalaya mountains several of the most important rajahs are in western india in a region known as rajputana and we can visit one of them on our way from benares to bombay the native state we select is jaipur it is almost twice as large as massachusetts and its population is over two millions the prince who rules it has the title of maharaja he is friendly to foreigners and will make us at home here we are at his capital it is said to be the finest native city in india and we have seen nothing like it so far in our travels imagine a city as big as omaha surrounded by a thick wall as high as a two-story house which is pierced by seven gates guarded by cannon let the buildings be of two stories and of the same height and painted rose pink let them stand close to the sidewalks with balconies projecting so that arcades run below from house to house enabling one to be out of the sun as he walks through the town let the streets be wide and as hard and as smooth as our best roads at home lay them out so that they cross one another at right angles and you have some idea of jaipur but look at the roofs they are flat and upon them sit or walk women and children clad in gay colors flocks of parrots pigeons and crows are flying about and resting here and there on them the balconies are filled with dark-faced men and boys wearing turbans and gowns and with bright-eyed hindu maidens whose faces are covered with shawls except that their eyes shine out through the folds we walk through the arcades stopping at the shops in which the dark-skinned bearded merchants sit cross-legged with their goods piled around them they have cottons and silks and jewelry of all kinds together with the knick-knacks and other wares used by the people we step out into the street and make our way 
through one of the most picturesque crowds of men and beasts to be found in the world the people are dark-faced and many of them are fine-looking some rush along and others move leisurely some are chatting others are pushing and yelling there are hundreds of camels sullenly stalking with ungainly stride through the crowds here comes one which a woman is riding she sits on the hump her bare feet upon which show golden anklets resting against the sides of the animal she has a shawl over her head but this is so folded that one of her black eyes can be seen as she motions her servant who is leading the beast where to go see that other camel coming up the street with a load of stones on each side his hump he has two great paving flags each as big as the top of a table slung there by ropes he is evidently disgusted for he moves along with his lower lip down pouting like a spoiled child at the side of the road kneels a third camel being loaded with lumber his drivers are tying long rafters one after another to his back at each addition the great beast blubbers and cries like a baby we can see the tears roll down from his proud angry eyes up the street ambles another camel ridden by a soldier and behind him is one with a boy on his back but look at the elephants there are a dozen of them each ridden by a black driver in white clothes and turban moving down the street double file those elephants belong to the rajah and the drivers are his servants who are taking the beasts out for exercise and then there are thousands of bullocks carrying hay stones and various kinds of merchandise here comes one with a man on his back he wears a turban and his long beard rich gown and red leather shoes turned up at the toes makes us wonder who he may be we see arabian horses ridden by the rajah's officials and others of the rich men of the city the riders have gold chains round their necks gold bracelets on their arms and gold rings on their fingers they wear gold embroidered turbans and cloth of gold vests while their lower garments are of cloths rich and costly they sit straight as they ride and by the side of each runs a groom who having cleared the way for his master goes back and trots along by his stirrup waiting for orders the crowd on foot is equally interesting see these hindu girls who are shouting out strange songs as they dance on the sidewalk they are dark-faced but by no means bad-looking they are dressed in gay-colored cottons and their persons are loaded with necklaces rings bracelets and anklets some of them have rings on their toes they are professional singers who are always in demand at weddings and parties behind them come some mohammedan women wearing a hideous costume it consists of a short purple jacket and a divided skirt of red cotton which is full at the waist and narrows as it goes downward fitting tight at the knees and the calves as we go on we see that all the women wear jewelry even those who work on the street breaking stones and carrying earth to smooth the roadway have great silver rings on their ankles and bracelets of silver or glass on their wrists many have rings in their noses and some little girls have rings and bells on their toes but here comes the street sprinkling machine of jaipur it is a brown-skinned half-naked man with a bag on his back the bag is a pigskin sewed up at the legs and tail the neck forming the mouth it contains several gallons and the man scatters the water over the street by holding his hand at the mouth of the bag and swinging himself this way and that as he walks he belongs to the caste of the water carriers whose business descends from father to son continuing our way through scenes of this kind we come at last to the palace and gardens of the maharaja they lie in an angle formed by the two main streets and cover one-seventh of the area of the whole city the palaces are large buildings surrounding courts paved with white marble they contain many rooms which are carpeted with splendid old rugs there is one great parlor whose floor is covered with hundreds of skins of tigers and leopards killed by the rajah but the officials have informed us that the rajah has ordered that the best of his elephants be brought out for us we are to spend a day in a jaunt through the country and the men ask us to first have a look at the elephants as they stand in the stables what magnificent creatures they are they are larger than any we have yet seen in our travels 
their heads are painted or tattooed in the patterns of a camel's hair shawl each beast has a brass chain about his neck and his white ivory tusks cut off at the ends are tipped with brass knobs and bound round with heavy brass rings we wait until the keepers lead the huge creatures out into the courtyard and order each to kneel down that he may be blanketed and have a saddle placed on his back the saddle is an immense wooden framework cushioned with cloth the beasts are so large that even when kneeling the saddles are high from the ground we do not know how to mount but the men bring out a ladder and we climb up step by step now the drivers have straddled the necks of the elephants each putting his legs behind the two great flapping ears they tell us to hold tight to the framework of the saddle and then give the signal to rise they do this by prodding the head or pulling at the ears of the elephant with steel hooks the beast understands he gives a grunt and then rises slowly swaying a little so that we have all we can do to hold on now we are high in the air moving along through the streets we are as high up as the roof of a cottage and the rajah's servants who have been ordered to accompany us seem far down as they trot along on each side the elephants go slowly but their motion is a swaying one and we bend from one side to the other having sensations much the same as when on a boat gently tossed by the waves we are almost seasick at first but this soon passes off and we begin to enjoy our strange ride we go out of the city and skirt the sides of the mountains near by our road leads over the hills through the wilds we are now far out in the country but nothing we meet seems to fear us the hindus are kind to wild animals and all things having life are respected by them we pass through woods where monkeys are jumping from tree to tree or sitting and chattering at us out of the branches as we ride by now and then one hops across the road in front of our elephants frightening them so that they jump backward and almost throw us to the ground we see wild peacocks walking unconcerned on the roadway they spread out their gorgeous tails to the rays of the sun and brush the ground with their wings like so many huge turkey gobblers along the slopes of the mountains we meet droves of wild hogs and not far from jaipur skirt a lake on the banks of which a half dozen black crocodiles look like great logs as they lie asleep in the sun the tame animals we see on the roadway are quite as strange as the wild ones of the woods we go by droves of little donkeys so loaded with bags and baskets that only their legs show indeed the loads seem to be walking off by themselves the donkeys are no bigger than newfoundland dogs their dark-skinned drivers yell at them in hindustani as they move slowly onward without either bridle or rein here comes a stage hauled by a camel it is filled with black-faced passengers on their way to jaipur to trade we pass other camels ridden by men women and boys who with inquiring eyes stare at us as we go by high up on our elephants some of the camel riders are by no means polite as i have learned by a shabby trick which one of them played upon me during a former ride which i took on an elephant we had gone several miles from jaipur and my elephant was rolling along on the trot it was hot and the flies swarmed about us in thousands they half covered the elephant and so attacked my face that i had to use one hand for fanning while i held on tight to the saddle with the other while so engaged a long black-skinned hindu came by on a camel he also was tormented by flies having so many that they made his white gown look black and fairly covered the skin of his beast as he drew near me he took his whip and gave the camel a cut the animal ran and as he passed the hindu unwound his long white turban and swept it back and forth on both sides of the camel thereupon the flies left him and attacked me and the elephant while he trotted ahead flyless we continue our ride on the elephants to amber an ancient but now ruined capital of the state of jaipur its palaces are deserted and its gardens are overgrown with luxuriant weeds we dismount from our great beasts and wander about through buildings of marble exquisitely carved visit the prisons once used by the rajahs and stay a while in a temple to watch some hindus sacrificing a black goat to kali their terrible goddess after this we have lunch and return to jaipur 
we are tired by the time we reach our hotel and when our elephants kneel we are glad to crawl down the ladders and go off to bed end of chapter thirty nine chapter forty of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b above the clouds or nature and man in the heart of the himalaya mountains we shall now leave the hot lowlands of india for a trip among the himalayas the word himalaya means the abode of snow and the tops of these mountains are crowned with perpetual frost they are the highest of all mountains and the tallest of their peaks have never been reached by man that of mount everest is farther above sea level than any other place upon earth it is more than twenty nine thousand feet high over twice as high as fujiyama the sacred snow-capped mountain of japan and more than a mile above the altitude of aconcagua the tallest of the andes it is more than nine thousand feet above the height of mount mckinley the highest peak on the north american continent and more than two miles higher than mont blanc the tallest of the alps the himalayas have scores of peaks each of which has an altitude far greater than mount blanc and at least forty which rise more than one mile higher than that famous monarch of the alps indeed it is said that you could drop the whole alpine range into some of the valleys of the himalayas and at a distance of ten miles there would be no perceptible change in the scenery we have read much about the glaciers of switzerland the himalayas have moving fields of solid ice from thirty to sixty miles in length and one of them thirty-three miles long lies between two mountains each of which is more than five miles in height the himalaya mountains and the hindu kush which is the name of the same chain farther west extend in the shape of a double wall upholding a wide irregular trough or valley clear along the northern boundary of hindustan the southern side of this wall rises steeply from the plains to a height of almost four miles and the average width of the whole is about as great as the distance between new york and washington while its length is equal almost to the distance between new york and denver it is this mighty wall and its location which makes these mountains the father of india this wall is intensely cold and as the warm winds loaded with the moisture of the indian ocean strike against it the moisture condenses and falls as rain creating the great rivers which water and feed the vast plains below there is no place upon earth which has a heavier rainfall than some parts of the himalayas in several places forty or fifty feet of water fall every twelve months the great plain of india which is so level that one can travel upon it from one side of hindustan to the other without seeing a hill is composed of the earth washings brought down by these rivers so that the himalayas have really built up the country the rivers are engaged in a similar work now at certain times of the year the indus the brahmaputra and the ganges are loaded with silt which by the irrigating canals is spread over lands making them produce as abundantly as the valley of the nile which is coated with a somewhat similar soil brought down from the mountains of abyssinia the scenery of these mountains is unlike that of the rockies the andes or the alps the himalayas lie almost on the edge of the tropics and the moisture rising from the plains and swept in by the winds from the indian ocean gives them a thousand clouds where the alps have one as we travel over them or climb about their rocky recesses we see masses of vapor of all sizes and shapes chasing each other over the hills at a distance of two miles above the sea the clouds crawl to our very feet up the steep sides of the valleys they wrap themselves around us and for a few moments the mist is so thick that we cannot see the heads of the horses upon which we are riding a moment later it is quite clear the clouds have passed onward and are losing themselves among the snows higher up during our travels in the himalayas we frequently have clouds both above and below us here they nestle in the hollows in the sides of the mountains looking almost like men who have sat down for a rest 
there they appear to have taken the forms of beasts and in single file race through the air in the morning the sun gilds the clouds so that they become masses of fire and at night the moon turns them to odd creatures of silver and gold at daybreak the valleys are filled with mist and we seem to be standing above an ocean of ice as we look the sun rises it kisses the peaks and the snow shines forth in all the colors and tints of the rainbow the place where we shall visit these wonderful mountains is at darjeeling a large village situated about a mile and a half above the level of the sea and under some of the highest of the himalaya peaks the climate there is cold although it is not very far north of calcutta from where we start for the hills we ride over the tropical plains on the railroad and as the land rises dash into jungles containing great thickets of bamboos and hundreds of banyan trees which send scores of sprouts down from their limbs into the earth and make the jungle almost impenetrable there are thousands of curious plants poisonous vines and great trees forming a vegetation so thick that we can see only a few steps from the train through the green these jungles are the home of the tiger and as we pass through them we may perhaps see the bright eyes of this fierce beast staring out of the darkness at the foot of the mountains we take a little narrow gauge railroad that carries us up to darjeeling its track is only two feet wide and it curves in and out among the trees like a snake our motive power is a small steam engine which takes us upward more than a thousand feet every hour there are a dozen horseshoe curves to the mile there are numerous loops and we cross our track again and again in making the gradual slope which will permit of our being moved farther on up into the clouds at times we skirt precipices covered with green down which out of the car windows we can look for a thousand feet and we climb along the sides of the mountains above valleys that fade away into the broad plains of bengal we soon leave the jungle and enter a region of huge forest trees some of which are two hundred feet high they are clothed with a luxuriant growth of moss and ferns and orchids of many beautiful colors and shapes are fastened to their trunks or hang down from their branches farther on we observe the tree fern whose tall round trunk is from ten to twenty feet long with immense fern leaves jutting out at the top like the fronds of a palm the air is full of moisture and the vegetation though not so thick as in the jungle below is luxuriant as we rise higher still the colour of the moss on the trees changes from green to frosted silver it is now somewhat like the spanish moss of our southern states it covers their limbs like a coat and hangs from their branches in clusters turning the woods into a forest of green dusted with silver at about a mile above the plains it is so much cooler that trees similar to those of our american mountains are growing in the villages roses are blooming and on the sides of the hills are immense tea gardens much like some we saw in japan the tea plant grows wild in parts of the himalayas its natural home is said to be assam one of the northeastern provinces of india where travellers say it sometimes reaches the size of a large tree it is supposed that the plant was taken from there into china from where it was carried further on to japan until within a few years by far the greater part of the tea of commerce was produced in china and japan the british however have established tea plantations in india and they are now raising vast crops of excellent leaves the tea they produce is shipped to all parts of the world and fully one-third of all the tea sent to europe and the united states is raised here moreover a great deal of tea is grown in ceylon so that india may now be called the most productive of all the tea countries the united states uses millions of pounds of indian teas and even now while in imagination we are away out here in the tea fields our parents may be drinking an infusion made from the leaves which last year grew on these very bushes we pass a number of villages on our way up the mountains and meet curious people at each stop of the train among them are the lepchas natives with faces not unlike those of our indians they are short and broad-chested with big calves and long arms they have copper-coloured skins and thick 
coal-black hair which hangs in long plaits or braids down their backs both sexes wear robes of striped coarse cotton cloth which fall below their knees leaving their arms free during the rainy season the lepchas put on high boots of deerskin as a protection from the terrible leeches that are then found in the mountains these leeches are bloodsuckers and they will fasten themselves to any part of your body they have been known to live for days in the jaws nostrils and stomachs of human beings causing dreadful suffering and death like the women of the other tribes of the himalaya mountains the lepchas are fond of ornaments of all kinds we see girls who have bracelets of silver covering their arms from their wrists to their elbows some have heavy rings of gold and silver about their ankles and flat pieces of gold tied to their ears not a few have jewelled buttons fastened in the flesh of their noses the bhutanese another hill tribe look not unlike the lepchas and dress much the same except that they paint their faces with a sort of brown varnish nearly every bhutanese woman wears on her person the greater part of her fortune she may have beads of coral and turquoise bound round her head and earrings of gold so heavy that they pull down the lobes of her ears even the poorest have jewelry of brass or stone if they cannot afford silver or gold the himalayan women are strong we see them digging in the fields and working like men little girls go along with big baskets tied to their backs and the older women thus carry loads of grain and other things even to the dirt used in fixing the roads sometimes a mother has her baby tied to her back arriving at darjeeling we are met at the station by rosy-cheeked girls who offer to take our baggage up to the hotel we hesitate to let girls act as our beasts of burden but finally consent whereupon each maiden picks up a trunk weighing perhaps two hundred pounds and trots off with it up the hill the charge for the load is an amount equal to about five cents of our money the men of the himalayas are as strong as the women although they work less they carry great knives in their belts and are very fierce looking we find good hotels at darjeeling it is a summer resort surrounded by the highest of the himalaya mountains and just far enough up their slopes to have a delightful climate while the plains below are sweltering in an almost tropical heat the place therefore has many mountain homes of the richer officials and foreign business men who live in the lowlands there are beautiful villas and bungalows with wide porches about them and also boarding houses and hotels another place much frequented by the british is simla situated in the himalayas hundreds of miles farther west it is to simla that the viceroy and the chief officials go in the hot season and for this reason it is sometimes called the summer capital of india it is a gay city during the summer but not so in winter for then it is cold and often covered with snow during our stay at darjeeling we journey about through the mountains we ride out before day to tiger hill to watch the sun rise on mount everest and make excursions to visit the tea plantations near by we go to the market in the centre of the town to purchase curios of the natives who come from long distances into this city to trade the men are fierce-looking fellows each of whom carries a great knife in his belt we buy odd knives and prayer wheels and also rings and necklaces set with turquoise and other half precious stones in our excursions we now and then stop at a village the mountaineers live in low huts made of mud and stone with roofs of straw thatch and but few of them have gardens or yards we see the women cooking out of doors and watch them at their meals observing that all eat with their fingers entering the huts we find but little furniture except boxes and a few pots and pans the mountaineers are uncivilized they are mostly worshippers of buddha and are in many ways like the tibetans the strange people whom we are to visit in the next stage of our travels End of chapter forty chapter forty one of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b tibet and the tibetans 
tibet is the most elevated inhabited region on earth it is so high up in the air that the hindus call it the roof of the world it consists of an immense plateau about one-eighth the size of the united states which is upheld between the himalayas at the south and other high mountains at the north the greater part of it being more than two miles above the level of the sea this lofty tableland is crossed by mountains and it has some parts which are more than three miles in height it has both fresh water and salt water lakes the mountains about it are the sources of the mekong hoang and yangtze and also of the brahmaputra and the indus the country is stony and rough and a great part of it is as arid and sterile as the desert of gobi which lies farther north as the warm winds of the indian ocean blow against the high cold wall of the himalayas they are laden with moisture but the cold condenses this and it falls as rain or snow so that when the winds blow north of the mountains they are comparatively dry indeed tibet is in places almost as dry as the sahara although its mountains are covered with snow for the greater part of the year in the short summer the valleys and plains are hot and as the winter comes on the weather grows so dry that the leaves on the trees wither and may be ground to powder between the fingers planks and beams crack and break and the people sometimes cover the woodwork of their houses with coarse cloth to preserve them the dryness of the air is such that salt is not needed for the keeping of food fresh meat can be left out of doors without spoiling the air sucks up the juices and the meat can be powdered like bread as soon as a sheep is killed it is skinned cleaned and hung up out of doors it quickly becomes a dry stiffened mass after which it may be kept a long time but what kinds of animals do they have on this high cold plateau there are donkeys sheep goats and yaks there are also horses and ponies and wild asses wild sheep and antelopes one species of antelope known as the chiru has a pair of long slender horns which extend almost straight upward from the crown of the head in front of the ears there is also a monkey which has a snub nose and long thick silky hair there are yaks wild and tame the yak is sure-footed and strong and it is sometimes used for carrying burdens over the mountains it is about as large as a good-sized cow and in some respects looks like one it has horns and hoofs and its body is covered with a thick coat of hair which in places is several inches long the yak's tail is more like that of a horse and is sometimes three feet in length it has a hump upon its shoulder which is composed largely of fat another tibetan beast is the musk deer from which comes the scent called musk this animal is smaller than any deer we have in america the musk is found in a little ball of fat enclosed in a sack beneath the skin of the abdomen the fat is of a dark brown chocolate color and it looks much like moist gingerbread when the deer is killed the fat is taken out and dried it is then shipped over the mountains to india or china and thence to the united states or europe where it forms the basis of many perfumes the people of tibet number more than six million they are mostly stock breeders and farmers they have irrigated patches in the valleys and raise hardy grains they have mines of gold salt and borax and also some of the finest turquoises known to the world the tibetans are exclusive and they do not like to have foreigners come to their country for centuries they kept all strangers out and it was only a few years ago that the british forced their way into the capital the city of lhasa and made a treaty with them by which trade could be carried on they acknowledge themselves to be subject to china although for the most part they are ruled by their lamas or priests of whom more is told farther on in this chapter these people are of the mongolian race and they have their own language they look much like our indians having high cheekbones and dark yellow or copper-colored complexions the men have no beards to speak of and all carry pincers to pull the hairs out of their faces the tibetans are divided into tribes each of which has its own customs although all dress much alike they have gowns which reach from the neck almost to the ankles and are tied in at the waist with girdles of wool in the winter they wear either sheepskins with the wool turned inward 
or so many furs that it is hard to tell where the furs end and the bodies begin the summer clothing consists of native woolen cloth the tibetans are fond of bright colors and especially of reds purples and blues both men and women wear boots made of red or yellow leather held up by garters attached to their tops in northern tibet the people have caps of cloth or felt trimmed with lambskin which come to a point at the crown these caps are sometimes covered with silk and they may be green red or blue in some sections of the country they have high hats shaped much like that of a korean gentleman but with a broader brim and a larger crown the brim is often faced with red silk the hat is tied on by a string around the throat both men and women are fond of jewelry the men frequently wear in the left ear an earring set with pearls and turquoises and often two inches long the women have chains of gold silver and copper about their necks they also wear earrings some of which are so heavy that a little strap is tied to the ring and passed over the top of the ear to take the weight from the lobe they adorn their hair with jeweled trinkets plating gold silver amber and coral in their braids and how do the tibetans live some of them have tents made of the coarse hair of the yak and others rude homes of wood or stone the latter being laid up in clay mortar most of the people live in villages there are only one or two towns which might be called cities the chief being lhasa the capital in the larger places we may find houses of three stories the homes of the rich they are built around a court and each of them may contain several rooms the poor man's house is seldom of more than two stories with a courtyard in front or behind it the ground floor is sometimes used as a stable there are very few windows in the houses except holes in the walls which may perhaps be covered with oiled paper fireplaces are used for cooking but there are no chimneys and the smoke must get out as it can the principal fuel is dried yak manure and this is so scarce that the cooking fires are expected to keep the house warm the tibetans live largely upon barley wheat beans and peas which they crush and grind into a meal and cook as a mush or in cakes they are fond of raw meat and seldom serve their meats more than half cooked they eat the flesh of yaks camels and hogs and like most people of cold climates are especially fond of fats a favorite dish is a soup of brick tea butter and water cooked into a thick fatty broth after this mixture has been taken from the fire some barley meat is added and it is churned in a little tea churn the broth which has now become a thick mush is ladled out in bowls and the people knead it into balls with their fingers before eating it both men and women are fond of tobacco which they carry about in horn boxes much like the powder horns of our colonial days all the men smoke and the priests and women take snuff these people are very religious they are buddhists and are largely ruled by the buddhist priests or lamas of whom the land has many thousands at the head of the priesthood is the grand lama who dwells in the potala a temple just outside lhasa he is usually a boy who is supposed to have the spirit of buddha within him the tibetans spend a great deal of their time in praying to buddha and they have machines of various kinds to multiply their prayers one of these is the prayer wheel a cylindrical tin or brass box which whirls around a stick or pin through its center a number of prayers are written upon a strip of paper and this is wrapped around the stick inside the box as the man rubs the stick between his palms the paper whirls and he believes that at every turn of the wheel he will have the credit of making as many prayers as there are on the paper large prayer wheels are often turned by the wind and sometimes by the waters of a creek or brook in such cases one has to only pull out a peg and the wind or water prays for him wiping away sin after sin so the tibetans think as long as the water flows or the wind continues to blow nearly all education in tibet is confined to the priesthood and the tibetan books are almost altogether religious ones among the queer customs of this country are those related to marriage instead of having several wives as is common in some asiatic countries 
the tibetan has only a part of one wife when a girl marries she often becomes the wife of all her husband's brothers or she may marry one or two extra men so that she has four or five husbands in such cases she is regarded as the head of the family and does most of its labor she cooks weaves and knits and also works in the fields in the towns nearly all the shops are kept by women and woman is the bread earner as well as the bread maker nevertheless she does not think that her fate is a hard one for a rich tibetan lady of lhasa once said that she pitied the women of other countries who were so poor that each could have only one husband but before leaving we must take a look at the city of lhasa it is the capital of tibet and the centre of its religion government and trade the people make pilgrimages to it and until recently they forbade all strangers to enter it on penalty of losing their lives it has now become more accessible however and we can find out how it looks it is not a large city containing at best not more than twenty five thousand people it lies in a plain called the plain of milk but we think it should be named the plain of water and mud for it is surrounded by swamps and is reached only by a roadway built through them the plain is about fifteen miles long and from two to five miles in width there are great mountains about it the peaks of which even in midsummer are covered with snow as to lhasa itself it is a town of palaces and hovels there are many rude one-story and two-story houses of stone cemented together with clay and larger ones of granite solidly built some of the homes of the priests have roofs washed with gold about two-thirds of a mile from the city of lhasa is the potala the great temple home of the grand lama this is a group of buildings which looks like a fortification it stands upon a rocky hill rising above it higher than any church steeple it is nine hundred feet long and has enough rooms to house hundreds of the grand lama's servants and about five hundred monks the grand lama's home is in the centre of the temple he is so sacred that he is seldom seen by any one but his servants and priests most of whom get down on their knees when they enter his presence the grand lama rules by the direction of advisers appointed by the chinese government of which country tibet is a dependency there are chinese soldiers at lhasa and chinese officials at the principal places and we meet chinese merchants and traders as we go through the country the chief foreign trade of tibet is with china and india goods are carried across the mountains on camels or yaks and are sold at the market towns upon the frontier the people import brick tea cloth and notions of various kinds they export wool cattle borax salt and also turquoises and gold so far most of the country has not been explored and it may have mineral riches of which we know nothing end of chapter forty one chapter forty two of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b afghanistan leaving tibet we return to india and take a long railroad ride across the great plain to lahore and north to peshawar at the entrance to the khaibar pass which leads into the wild country of afghanistan we have secured permits to enter this land from the amir its monarchical ruler and he has sent out a company of soldiers to guard us on the way to his capital our travels are through the grandest of mountain scenery the snowy peaks seem even higher than those about darjeeling and many of them are really three or four miles above the level of the sea we climb slowly over one awful pass after another now skirting precipices many hundred feet deep and now crossing deserts of sand and valleys covered with rocks we see irrigated fields here and there and occasionally some patches of trees on the mountains we cross raging streams go through long winding gorges and climb over places so high that we have to frequently stop and rest on account of the thinness of the air at last we come down into a green fertile valley in which the many cultivated fields and orchards of fruit trees are separated by a network of ditches 
through which cool water flows we ride for some miles in this valley and finally reach kabul the capital of afghanistan kabul is situated in the hindu kush range on the banks of a river which flows out of a gorge in the mountains the city is about a thousand feet higher than denver and it has nearly the same number of people the afghans are mostly mohammedans and therefore their houses are surrounded by walls so that we cannot look in as we walk through the streets the houses are usually of only one story and the best have many rooms connected only by doors and without halls or passages they have gardens about them and orchards loaded with fruit the business part of the city consists of bazaars the streets through which are so roofed as to keep out the sun the main roads run out from these bazaars in four directions they are badly paved and have no modern improvements during our stay in the city we meet many of the people they are of different tribes and have very queer costumes the men wear turbans and gowns and nearly every man we see carries a gun or a sword there is a great difference of conditions some of the people are rich and powerful and others poor and oppressed the relations of the several classes are similar to those which prevailed in europe during feudal times and civilization is more backward than in india china or japan afghanistan is governed by an absolute monarch who is called the emir he has also another title which means light of the nation and religion he has an army of about one hundred thousand men and could make a strong fight in case of war he rules by many officials having large public offices here at kabul where we can learn much about the land and its people we find that afghanistan is a large country it is bigger than either france or germany and it would make about six states the size of virginia it is mostly mountainous the great range of the hindu kush running through it it has some rushing rivers and many streams some of which go dry in the summer the only cultivated places are in the valleys and upon the foothills and in little nests in the mountains most of the farming is done by irrigation and two harvests are often reaped in one year the first crop is sown in the fall and cut in the summer it consists of wheat and barley and some peas and beans the second crop is sown at the end of the spring and reaped in the autumn it is mainly rice millet and indian corn afghanistan has numerous orchards and fruit is so abundant that it forms the principal food of a large class of the people we see apples pears almonds and peaches sold in the bazaars and also quinces apricots figs cherries and grapes quite a large amount of preserved fruit is exported and much is laid away for the winter we are told that the country is rich in minerals and that it has iron gold copper and lead there are also precious stones of fine quality only small parts of the mountainous regions have been prospected and there are probably other rich mineral deposits of which no one knows but who are the afghans they look far different from the tibetans and most of the east indians they have straight eyes and light brown complexions some have rosy cheeks and not a few long silky beards many being descendants of the same race as our own the afghans are of several different tribes and they number altogether four or five million scattered here and there in villages and cities over the country we ask what these people do for a living and are told that they are chiefly engaged in farming fruit raising and in rearing cattle and horses they have also camels ponies and donkeys a few are employed in manufacturing they weave carpets and cloths of silk and wool and make shoes and other things of leather their exports include wool silk and tobacco and also drugs spices hides cattle and horses they import cotton goods indigo dye stuffs sugar and tea and also foreign wares of various kinds the trade of the country amounts to six or more million dollars a year our travels through afghanistan are on camels and ponies and we go nowhere without soldiers to guard us we see no foreigners for the emir does not usually allow them to come here and so far he has prevented the building of railroads he has been able to do this largely because of the location of his kingdom between the possessions of russia and great britain these two great powers are jealous of each other and in the past 
they have been glad to have a state like afghanistan so situated that it has kept british india and russian turkestan apart for the same reason they have not encouraged the opening of the land to trade and railroads this will probably be changed at some time in the future and the railroad systems of the russian provinces at the north and those of india at the south will be connected by a line across afghanistan when this is constructed one will be able to go almost the whole way from any part of europe to india by rail End of chapter 42chapter forty three of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b persia we are in persia today we have come south through baluchistan a dependency of india and then moved on westward we are now travelling along upon camels over a wild desert plateau cut here and there by great mountains from the snows of which are fed rivers which irrigate little valleys and patches of plain now and then we pass a salt lake and again we may travel for miles where the land is as sandy and stony as the desert of gobi this is the general character of persia it is a high plateau nearly level except where the mountains cut through it it is almost a desert and were it not for the mountains whose cold air squeezes the water out of the winds it would be altogether arid and sterile the country is large from east to west it is as long as the distance from new york to chicago and from north to south its width is as long as from boston to cleveland its area all told is three times that of germany and equal to about one-sixth of the whole of our union persia would make fifteen ohio's or kentucky's or virginia's or more than ten states the size of iowa illinois or wisconsin nevertheless it has only fifteen people to the square mile or about nine or ten millions in all the persians are not unlike the afghans they have light brown or yellow faces straight eyes and dark hair most of the men are bearded and have their heads shaved they wear great cone-shaped caps or turbans and long gowns which are tied in at the waist and fall almost to the feet under their gowns they have on very full pantaloons in the winter many wear furs as we move slowly along through the country we see comparatively few women these people are mohammedans whose women are not supposed to be seen by other men than their husbands the women live to a large extent in the back rooms of the houses and when they come out they are clad from top to toe in a long black or blue gown with a strip of white cloth at the front this strip is fastened on around the forehead and extends over the gown almost to the ground in the top of it just in front of the eyes is a window of fine lace through which the wearer can see as she walks along the street indoors the women wear divided skirts which reach to their knees and loose-fitting sacks with long sleeves they always have their own part of the house for it is a disgrace for them to meet any other men than those of their own families for this reason whenever a man is about to enter the home of a friend he is expected to stop at the gate and shout out some such words as woman away in order to give the women a chance to fly to their own quarters before he appears a persian does not ask after the wife of his friend and if he should be so impolite as to do so his host in replying would not refer to his wife by name or as his wife but as the mother of his children for instance if the persian's name were smith and he had a son named john he would not say my wife is well or mrs smith is well but i thank you little johnny's mother is so so to-day the persian women have but few rights the parents arrange all the marriages and girls are often married at ten and boys at sixteen or eighteen there are but few bachelors and not many old maids most of the persians live in cities or villages we see their towns as we travel over the country the villages are in or near the irrigated lands they are usually square consisting of dark narrow streets lined with houses each of which stands in a yard surrounded by high walls the houses are of clay stones or sun-dried brick those of the better classes 
being coated with mortar or plaster of paris the roofs are almost flat they are made by laying timbers on the mud walls and covering the timbers with brush upon which is put a layer of mud mixed with straw every summer a fresh coat of mud is spread on and as a result many of the roofs are a foot or more thick these houses have but little furniture the floor is the ground well pounded down with matting spread over it and sometimes over the matting beautiful rugs the floors of most homes form the tables and chairs of the family the people sleep there at night using no sheets and covering themselves with thick quilts in the daytime the bedding is rolled up and put away in a corner the cooking is done upon fires out of doors or in fireplaces the persians eat with their fingers and the plates of the poorer classes are sometimes thin cakes of bread when a man is through with the rest of his food he may eat up his plate and during the meal he tears off bits of it and by bending them in half uses them as pincers to convey the meat from the soup to his mouth the diet of the common people is largely made up of bread cheese and milk with a little soup or meat in the form of a stew once a day they drink a great deal of tea and some coffee outside each village are threshing floors places where the ground has been pounded and rolled until it is as hard as stone the wheat or barley is brought here from the fields and oxen are driven over it to thresh out the grain then the farmers take their wooden pitchforks and toss the grain into the air until the chaff has all blown away the straw is kept for stock feeding the chief business of the persians is farming and the rearing of stock the farms are irrigated by the streams from the mountains and canals for this purpose have long been in use the country produces great quantities of wheat barley and rice it has also large mulberry orchards which feed silkworms and it exports raw silk silk cocoons and silk stuffs many fine fruits are grown the first peaches mentioned in history came from persia and the country is celebrated for its excellent dates the sheep are of the fat-tailed variety many of which we have seen in our travels through asia they produce excellent wool from which are woven beautiful cloths and the finest of rugs persia has also donkeys camels ponies and horses as fleet as those of arabia much of the stock belongs to the nomads who dwell in tent villages and move about from place to place to find pasture the villagers drive their flocks and herds into their yards at night and take them out in the morning the milk of cows sheep and goats is universally used and they have an odd custom to make the cows let down their milk they believe a cow will go dry if it knows that its calf has been taken away and so after killing the calf they stuff the hide with straw and place it beside the cow at milking time but let us take a look at some of the cities of persia we shall first visit tehran the capital it is situated in the northern part of the country some distance south of the caspian sea and not far from a range of magnificent mountains whose peaks during much of the year are covered with snow many of them measure over two miles in height and away off at the east can be seen one which is more than seventeen thousand feet high tehran has some fine houses but most of the buildings are of sunburnt brick they are surrounded by walls built close to the edges of narrow streets through which canals run there are also many mosques with egg-shaped domes faced with tiles of bright blue and a number of large buildings devoted to the officials of the government and the colleges and schools the city is the largest in persia it has about three hundred thousand people other towns of considerable size are tabriz ispahan meshed and kerman which range from sixty thousand to two hundred thousand population tehran is especially important in that it is the capital and seat of the government it is here that the shah has his palaces and here parliament meets until nineteen o six persia was an absolute monarchy ruled by the shah who used the revenues as he pleased he spent but little towards developing the country and was often able during his reign to lay aside a vast portion in diamonds and other precious stones he had the power of life and death and many of his actions were very oppressive this continued until the beginning of the present century when the people began to object 
and in nineteen o six they forced the shah to grant them a parliament or national council which should fix the taxes and control all things of public importance this parliament was elected and persia is now governed by it under the shah so that the country may be called a constitutional monarchy the kingdom is divided into thirty-three provinces each of which has several districts there are governors over the provinces and lieutenant governors over the districts and in addition every town has its mayor besides the people so governed are several hundred thousand nomads who live in tents and move about with their flocks from place to place they are divided into many tribes each of which has its chief who collects the taxes and pays them to the general government we are told that persia is rapidly improving under the new government formerly its only schools were those connected with the mosques the teachers being the mohammedan sheikhs and the children were taught little more than to read the koran and perhaps how to write today the government is establishing new schools which teach the same studies we have and in some of which the children learn english a number of newspapers are now being published and many movements have been started to develop the country caravan and wagon roads are being laid out to connect the chief cities and in time will come railroads leaving tehran we take a long caravan trip during which we visit the city of tabriz the chief business center tabriz lies in northeastern persia not very far from mount ararat where it is said noah's ark rested after the flood the town is made up of a vast number of one-story and two-story buildings with larger buildings here and there scattered through it the houses are surrounded by walls built close to the streets and the streets are so narrow that we are often crowded against the walls to keep out of the way of the donkeys and camels which with great loads on their backs are continually passing through this way and that we spend some time in the bazaars they consist of little shops built along both sides of streets which are so roofed that the sun cannot come in the shops are much like those of india each merchant sits in a little cell walled with goods and he has goods piled around him he usually sits cross-legged on the floor and the customers stand out in the street as they shop there are no price marks the man charges as much as he thinks he can get and the buyer offers as little as he thinks he can make the man take the result is that it requires a long time to buy anything how be it many of the articles sold are of considerable value and some are wonderfully beautiful this is especially so of the rugs for which the country has been famous for ages persian carpets were bought by the ancient greeks and during the middle ages they were carried to venice and from there over the alps into north europe persian shawls are also greatly admired and some are worth hundreds of dollars there are many rugs made in tabriz in one factory there we see a thousand boys weaving them in all sizes and of different designs the boys are paid about ten cents a day we visit also many smaller factories and find rug making going on in most of the villages the rugs are all made by hand and a fine one may require months of continuous labor a considerable part of this product is shipped to america End of chapter 43